and uh, perhaps first to correct a little bit, it is not my project, it is a project group. It was uh, first, it is initiated by Mohamed Varaybe, who came with an Abdul idea to say how can we investigate uh, specific uh, processes of uh, canon building and exploring in Islamic uh, history, and then we discussed it with Basim Ziri, <coughs> myself, and we have also the help of Iman Zayat. So it is a, it is a group research. And um, yeah, so the idea is to reflect a little bit about processes of uh, canonization and censorship and how they work um, in the history of Islamic ideas and theology. And um, our approach was to combine uh, intellectual history and a mythical uh, understanding of several um, cases uh, with um, historical and, and social science approaches coming from uh, historical and social sciences. So, yeah, you can see um, the responsibility, the contributions, uh, or perhaps first the structure of the project. Uh, it was a short-term project uh, funded by uh, the RIDG and um, so it is only one here. Um, for us well, it was very difficult also to do all this work because we realized that the topic is very huge and very big, so, but uh, it was just one year uh, that we had. And uh, the idea was to have two workshops, one conference and one publication uh, that is in preparation and uh, that is um, uh, prepared uh, or foreseen for, I think, 2023. Um, As you can see, there have been uh, 46 applications, and we have chosen out of these 46 applications, if I'm not absolutely wrong, uh, 46 applications, and we have chosen uh, 26 uh, case studies or papers out of this. Can you? I have to switch. So. Um, out of this um, proposals, and um, it was huge challenge because as you can see the topics, the subjects, uh, the research questions, uh, but also the periods and the ge geographical areas have been very very uh, different uh, and there's a huge variety in all of these uh, categories. If you just want to cross some of the titles, uh, the uh, um, working titles, Canonization of Al Muhaqqar Al Hibis work in the Shiite fiqh, uh, sound hadith and Indian Hanafism, Adam literature at the fuzzy border of the canon, forbidden tafsir and promoted tafsir in late Ottoman uh, period, the relationship between canonicity and dispersive ramification within the commentary tradition as illustrated by An Nasafi. Shifting Orthodoxes Mohammed and the Zainab al Jahsh affair, and so on, so on. So, you can see there. So, we have started the call for papers and received a lot of material, a lot of ideas, a lot of reflections. And that's why we have uh, chosen to, uh, um, to try to build a fundament with these two workshops. The first workshop was dedicated to the idea of canonization. And the second workshop was dedicated to theories, approaches to the idea of um, uh, censorship. Um, and uh, it was also a very uh, difficult discussion for us because you can see also that all these researchers are coming from different backgrounds all over the, the, the world and places and times also. And um, so on the one hand we wanted to have a fundament um, and theoretical framework uh, in order to, to, to shape a little bit our discussion and uh, on the background of all of these different uh, studies. But on the other hand, uh, surely there's a certain accus accusation that we uh, uh, impose a certain idea of what is membership and what is uh, uh, canonization, which could be very European. 
So it is uh, a difficult uh, situation for us, but um, finally, um, and also within the discussions with all of these uh, researchers, we found very uh, useful to have uh, this um, um, common discussion about theoretical approaches and reflections on canonicity and on, and on uh, censor, uh, censorship. Uh, in order to um, to shape in a little bit also all of these studies, uh, so I think it was a very fruitful um, uh, approach. Yeah, yeah uh, perhaps one one last note, one last remark. Um, you can see also there there are different subjects. Uh, there are di um, you can see some of these papers or studies are related to FIP, others to theology others to, um, um, to, to, to uh, Sufi thought. Uh, we have different periods coming from the period of early Islam just to the uh, 21st century. We have different regions from Indonesia to Canada and the United States. Um, so it was very, uh, it was very challenging, uh, but it was also very uh, revealing to have uh, the two workshops in order to yeah, to canalize, to, uh, to, to prepare the, the, the road for the conference in Berlin. It was uh, late uh, 2021 that the conference took place. I want to share some, some ideas or reflections about the process of canonization. Uh, first, it is very uh, difficult to identify theories of canonization because uh, this is very large, uh, very uh, large field. They, most of the approaches are coming from uh, uh, literature sciences and art sciences. They ask, for example, why the Beatles are becoming canonical at a certain period, or why is Van Gogh a masterpiece with transtemporal meaning? And we try to, um, yeah, to ship, uh, to take these approaches and to apply them on Islamic intellectual history. And so it is not, um, yeah, it was a little bit uh, um, uh, experimental, at least to say. And then there are different approaches coming from sociology, Niklas Ruman, for example, from religious sciences. Uh, and the more we are coming to Islamic sciences, uh, the lesser are uh, the uh, approaches developed. and. Uh, Finally, we can say, uh, in between Islamic studies, we find very rarely elaborated concepts of canonization and uh, in, a lesser, uh, in a lesser sense also censorship. There's from uh, Aziz al uh, there are some very useful and fruitful um, ideas, but yeah, uh, in general it is very, very, uh, very few. Uh, what we have found out is that uh, canonization is a neg negotiation uh, within a group and it's very interesting uh, to see that um, canonization has a lot to do with, uh, with um, dynamics within a group and that there are different types of acceptance and rejections uh, in regard of an authority which is accepted or not and uh, these dynamics create adherence or exclusion from that group. But we did not find something that you can say it is a classic, a classical is Islamic canon, uh, perhaps with the exception of the Quran. But if you see, if you look to different schools and different periods, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of different uh, canons and a variety of different canons. The means of negotiation, every utterance of uh, communication, you can say, at least public speech, literature, sermons, discussions. Uh, there are uh, specific symbols and objects of canonicity, which are items, persons, uh, ideas, and texts. Uh, they uh, they figure as um, as a canonical uh, and symbolic uh, authority for this certain group or for a certain group. Uh, these um, we have also found that there are a lot of um, uh, of ways to practice uh, and to, to recall the um, the adherence to a certain uh, group. 
uh, and this is due by uh, rituals and, uh, and gestures. Uh, they play a huge role in establishing uh, the, the community of a certain uh, canon. And um, as we can see also, there are a lot of external factors, uh, political patronage, historical events. We have spoken this morning also about environmental in, uh, events. So there's also the uh, thesis uh, by uh, Hobsbawm, for example, who says that can, uh, canon is established in moments of, um, of friction. And this friction can be, uh, um, can be done by external factors or by internal factors. Um, now some, uh, some ideas about the uh, the term of uh, censorship, which is even harder and more difficult to, uh, to grasp um, and to find uh, literature approaches um, to that concept. So it is often time that you speak about censorship by speaking um, actually about uh, canonization. And there are very few, uh, there's very few reaches uh, that really emphasize on the idea of censorship. Uh, we can. Uh, there is also another difficult difficulty that uh, censored works normally do not uh, uh, are not transmitted, do not survive history. So this is also uh, an, a prob methodological problem within the work with this uh, concept of censorship <laughs> and uh, the objective of tracing back um, processes of censorship. Uh, then you have a very common uh, differentiation uh, between conventional understanding and discursive understanding of censorship. Uh, conventional understanding means every, um, every uh, restriction by, uh, by, by state power, every con constraint by a state power. Uh, and you can find this, for example, in Islamic history, if you, uh, when we look to the Mihna, the famous Mihna in the 19th, in the 9th century, uh, in the Abbasid Caliphate, um, yeah, where it is very clear that someone with state power wanted to uh, oblige uh, a certain idea of Muslim uh, theological thinking. Then there is the second main understanding of censorship, it is a discursive understanding. This comes from works of uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Judith Butler, and um, Foucault. Uh, there, the idea is that restriction is the result of dominating public discourses, which are led in that or that way. And it is very interesting that we can see, for example, that. Um, different dynamics of network building uh, in, Islamic, uh, um, in Islamic literature um, has uh, led also uh, to such kind of phenomena where certain opinions or certain figures have been excluded from uh, a predominant public uh, um, opinion about a certain issue. So we can we can find both of these uh, two understandings. Uh, and then there are more subtle mechanisms of censoring, uh, the way of portray portraying certain peoples and certain figures, uh, the way uh, with which uh, some details are omitted or added or uh, hidden narratives. So um, it is very interesting to use uh, some techniques of lit lit literary analysis in order to identify such kind of very subtle and hidden uh, ways of censoring. Uh, and what one, one of the main results was that network and text analysis might provide very useful instruments for investigation. Now, if you can, uh, if we look to the conference and some final results, um, I think for us it is very, it became very clear that you can, cannot talk about, speak about canon in a very classical and, and in a very narrow way, but that there is uh, actually the idea of a plurality of different canons that are working at the same time, and sometimes 
a certain canon is more dominant than another, but you have a kind of um, an archive of, of uh, underlying and living canons, and these canons are activated in the need of a certain group in order to create signification and meaning uh, in regard with a certain um, uh, challenge. May it be a political challenge uh, or a religious challenge. So there's a variety of uh, canons which are activated by, uh, by the groups according to several uh, needs. Uh, there are a lot of factors which, uh, which uh, add to the uh, process of canon building, social, intellectual, but also uh, technolo uh, technological and political factors. Um, yeah, something we, we have found which could be, yeah, it is like uh, uh, first trace that apparently in Islamic intellectual history there are oftentimes some two dynamics, opposing dynamics. It is one the dynamic of extension, shara, and uh, then there's the opposite dynamic of abridgment, uh, the muhtasar, and you can see in different works, for example, when the author says um, this this booklet it is too too dense, I need to give it give more extension uh, and more explication in order that students can uh, understand. So he engages in the sharh of a certain book and on the other hand we have the other dynamic that uh, certain authors, they, they, they are writing, explaining in their foreword that a certain material is too elaborated for students and that uh, that's why they have to shorten this material and uh, to publish such a uh, muhtasar. And these two dynamics of uh, extension and enrichment, they can be seen also as two dynamics that define uh, canonization uh, processes uh, in, in, the, in the sense that they narrow canon or they widen canon. And perhaps an, an, another last aspect is uh, the relation between affirmation and uh, deconstruction construction of canon in the theological context. So it is a little bit the question that Amina you had raised also yesterday, what is left uh, if we are just doing, uh, if we are just problematizing and just deconstructing and with canon is also a little bit the same. Canon is very, uh, has a very bad reputation. No one wants to have a canon because it is very critical. But on the other hand, um, we found uh, one very interesting idea coming from literature and art. Uh, for example, the power of reception. What does it that the Beatles become a canon? It was the power of a moment. Uh, um, Ibrahim Musa he spoke yesterday also of the momentum um, yeah, of a certain Elan, for example. And it is very interesting to ask what makes a situation or behavior of a person um, or something like this uh, or, or, or a project or a piece what makes that piece or that thing something that um, uh, creates such a power of reception that it becomes something uh, something trans uh, temporal so this is an important question i think um, yeah that uh, that uh, was one of the results, and as I said, it is one it was one year. It was very, yeah. It was very uh, time was running, and uh, it, we, we 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 realized that you can do a lot of more work, and you have to do a lot of more work, um, and uh, so perhaps it is an initiative. Uh, project to 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 um, to enlarge for further uh, projects in the future. So these are some ideas. We have the chance that Haider Bassem and uh, Mohammed are also with us here. So if you want to add something, you are so welcome. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.